Kuburan Tazim Tinyuj Kuburan Kuburan Ye Kesenat Nanto Nawan Sultan Tawara Mayuj Ibu Kuburan Tuluj Adukan ሰሚዞ ጥናትም ግን እንደዚህ ሆ በግለሰቦች 
ላይ በተመሰረተና በአንዳንድ የውጭ ተቋማት ላይ በተመሰረተ አቅም ላይ ብቻ መመስረት ሳይሆን ራስን ይችላል ያን ለይቶ የጥናትና ምርምር ክንፉን እና ዘርፉን ማጠናከር ያለበት ነው እና ይሄን እንደ ትልቅ የለው ትቅድ የተያዘ ነው ከዚህ ጋር ተያይዞ እንግዲህ አንድ አደራ የምንለው ደግሞ ምንድነው ብዙ ባለም ደረጃ የታወቁ ስመጥር የሆኑ ገናና የሆኑ እና እንደነ ዶክተር ዮሐንስ እንደነ ዶክተር ጌታ እንደነ ዶክተር ዮናስ እንደነ ዶክተር ብርሃን ያሉ ግን ከስራቸው ደግሞ ምን ያክል ተከታዮች አፍርተናል ያን ለሊታቆም ይችላል ምክንያቱም የሰው ልጅ ትልቁ ነገር ምንድነው በየው ዘመኑ ከሚሰራው የበለጠ ይልቅ ያ ስራ እንዲቀጥል ቀርጾ አንጾ ሜንተር አድርጎ የሚያልፈው ሰው የበለጠ ደሞ ተቃሚ ነውና ምናልባት ተላላቅ የዘርፉ ተማራማሪዎችን በዚህ በኩል ትክሮት እንድታደርጉ እጠይቃለሁ ከዛ ጋር ተያይዞ ደሞ አዳዲስ የተጀመሩ ከፓሊዮንቶሎጂ ውስጥ ለምሳሌ እንደ ኮምፓራቲቭ አናቶሚ አሁን እየተዋቀረ ያለው እየተደራጀ ያለው ክፍልም እንደዚህ ነው ወደፊት አንድ መስክ ሆኖ ለሀገሪቱም ብዙ ገቢ የሚያስገኝ ይሆናል ብሎ ይተማናል በዚያም መልኩ አስተዋጽኦ ምታደርጉበት ነገር ብትፈልጉ እንግዲህ ዛሬ እዚህ ያገናኘን የ3.8 ሚሊዮን አመት ያስቆጠረ የቅድመ ሰው የራስ ቅልቅሪት አካል ድንገት የተገኘ ሳይሆን ለ15 አመታት በቦታውና በዘርፉ ከፍተኛ ተቃም ተደርጎበት ረምር ተደርጎበት የተገኘ ነው እንግዲህ የኦራን ሶሜሌ ፕሮጀክት በ15 አመታት ጉዞ ይሄን ብቻ ሳይሆን ካራት በላይ የሆኑ በነቸር መጽሔትም የታተሙ ልዩ ግኝቶችን ለሀገራችን ያበረከተ ነው እንግዲህ ብዙ ሳል ሄድ የጥበብ መጀመሪያው እግዚአብሔር መፍራት ነው ይባላል ከዛ በተጨማሪ ደግሞ ምንድነው ነገርና ንግግርን ማሳጠር ነውና የዚህ ፕሮጀክት ማሪ የሆኑትን ዶክተር ዮሐንስ አይለስላሴን በክሌቭላንድ የተፈጠሩ ሳይንስ ሙዚየም ተማራማሪ እንዲሁም በተጨማሪ ዶክተር ሙርጌታ አለነ ከአዲስ አበባ ዩኒቨርሲቲ ዶክተር ስቴፋኒ ሜሊሎን ከላይፕሺክ ኢንስቲትዩት ፎር ኢቮሉሽነሪ አንትሮፖሎጂ እና ሌሎችንም በፕሮጀክቱ ድጋፍ እየሰጡ የተባበሩትን ያመሰግንኩና እንኳን ደስ አላችሁ ይላሉ መድረኩን ለዶክተር ኢማኑኤል ሳይለስላሴ አስተካክለው አመሰግናለሁ what this is why this species is also the because um animensis okay thanks johannes um the first step in our analysis was to answer a very basic question what species does mrd belong to and we started by considering the most likely candidates of course afarensis which is lucy's species is very well represented in the afr triangle between about three and a half and three million years ago And then we also have Anamensis, which is best known from Kenya between about 4.2 and 3.9 million years ago. But also recently, um, our colleagues from the Middle Awash discovered Anamensis uh, in the Afar Triangle. Um, we were able to reject the idea that MRD belonged to Afarensis pretty easily. And that's because we had the whole cranium of MRD and we could make comparisons with whole crania of Afarensis which were discovered in the Hadar region. And when we made these comparisons, we saw a lot of differences. Um, in contrast, when we were making comparisons with Anamensis, the material that we had to work with was much more limited. Because Anamensis was previously known primarily from jaws and teeth, our comparisons with MRDs were restricted to this area. So here on the left side, you can see the regions of the skull that were previously known from anamensis and then on the right how mrd fills in the gaps um because uh, so in each of these regions in the upper jaw in the teeth and in this small region around the ear um we saw a number of similarities between what was already known of anamensis and mrd and just to give a specific example um canine morphology played an important part in determining that mrd uh, was assigned to anamensis for instance the overall size and uh, dimensions of the mrd canine are distinctive of anamensis so here we see a graph that shows variation in canine dimensions 
and we see M R um, afferent, uh, anamensis, excuse me, in green, and this little black dot represents MRD falling among all of the previously known anamensis canines. And there were also additional anatomical features of the canine that confirmed assignment to anamensis. And so here we see one well-preserved afferensis canine on the left, and on the right, a collection of anamensis canines in progressive stages of wear. And the immediate, the two canines uh, to the very right, we can see one that was previously known from anamensis from Kenya, an MRD. And what we can see from these two is that they are a very good match for one another. So um, canine morphology, in addition to upper jaw morphology and this ear region, supported assignment to anamensis. And for some of the ma uh, major take-home points, we'd like to just give a summary. The first is that MRD shows overlap between anamensis and afarensis in the Afar Triangle for about 100,000 years. And this conclusion hinges on differences that we saw between MRD and another fossil that was previously known from the Afar region called the Belodili frontal, which was um, discovered in Middle Awash in the 1980s. Secondly, as the oldest cranium known within the genus Australopithecus, MRD bridges a gap between the very oldest known hominins that fall around um, six to five million years ago and Lucy species afarensis, which is best known from about three and a half to three million years ago. And in MRD, we see some distinctive features of the face that are specific to Australopiths in combination with some interesting features of the cranium that are known only from the very oldest uh, fossils. And finally, MRD confirms previous ideas about where anamensis fits in the bigger picture of human evolution. So previously, when we knew anamensis only from these jaws and teeth, um, our colleagues put forward a very convincing case that anamensis falls evolutionarily between older species like Artipithecus ramidus and the younger afarensis. But when we are interested in investigating evolutionary relationships, we're most interested to work with complete crania. And so having MRD basically allowed us to go back with a new set of data consisting of uh, observations from the face and neurocranium and look again at this idea about where anamensis fits in our evolutionary tree. And we were interesting to find that these new observations from MRD put anamensis in the exact same position in terms of falling between Ramidus and afarensis. So these are the kind of three major points that we um, describe as significant in this paper. And with that, we'd like to uh, acknowledge the following institutions as well as our colleagues who've made this research possible. And with that, I think we'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Questions? Everything is clear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything is clear, huh? You got it all. Okay, Dr. Brahani. <coughs> it's easy.
So this is a very spectacular discovery, and thank you very much for your hard work. Stephanie did a very impressive uh, presentation in a very simplified, simplified way, and you really need to be applauded by everybody. And thank you very much for your hard work. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, yes. Dr. Jonathan. So I have a question for uh, Dr. Bouvier about context. Okay. Mm. So given that the, the pieces were found ex situ, were there any apparent metrics that made you uh, conclude that they belong to the, to the sediment of interest that you gave? Sorry. Come again? Sorry. So given that the, the, the pieces, the two pieces that conjoined and the other pieces that were seen were found uh, close to the surface, how was it determined that they belong to the city? They came from the very city that you were interested in. Yeah, I think the answer to that would be better answered by Dr. Johannes in terms of it was about how it's determined and where the context, but whether it is <coughs> right on the surface or inside, it's better answered by Dr. Uh, Johannes. Okay. Um, so the, the one thing that I had to mention is um, before we exported it for CT scanning, I had to clean it, meaning it was covered with metrics, and that metrics is sandstone. That sandstone matches the sandstone that's already in place. So there was a clear indication that the specimen got eroded out of the sandstone. So in terms of provenience, we don't have any problems because all of the other pieces that we found through sifting and picking had also some sandstone metrics on them. So we were able to match the metrics on the specimen, especially the metrics that was inside the nose and at the, at the bottom, was exactly the same as uh, the, uh, the horizon that is, that is still there in situ. But the specimen was not, was not in situ, it was just exposed from the surface. That's, that's why you know, the guy found the maxilla, otherwise he would have been there buried forever. You know. Any other question? Yes, AFP. Mm -hmm. Agence France Presse? Yeah. Oui. Mm -hmm. um, so beyond the conclusions that you've already presented, are there any other questions that this finding might be able to help answer upon maybe additional analysis? Uh, I would say yes, because one of the key questions that we have around 4.4 to about 4.2 and even younger is how Ardipithecus rhamnus at 4.4 is related to Australopithecus because at 4.2 we, we think that there was a major adaptive shift from the habitat that was uh, Ardipithecus rhamnus to the habitat of Australopithecus as a genus. So what we would like to see is this specimen has a lot of primitive features that look like earlier forms. So how, how do we create the connection between earlier forms such as Ardipithecus rhamnus and Australopithecus anamensis? For now the hypothesis is Ardipithecus rhamnus is the most likely ancestor of Australopithecus anamensis. But we need to have some evidence, morphological and uh, like elements. We don't have um, a lot of postcranial elements from like 4.3. Uh, we have one postcranial element of Australopithecus anamensis from about 3.9, but that's not going to help you how. Ardipithecus rhamnus is related to Australopithecus anamensis. So we still need more data from that time period between 4.4 and 4.2, and I think that's, that's what we're going to look for. But this specimen, MRD, the fact that it's really primitive compared to Australopithecus afarensis tells us that this lineage here has some similarities, or the Australopithecus anamensis has similarities with the earlier forms such as Ardipithecus rhamnus, and it helps us link those two lineages. But we still need more evidence, particularly from the postcranium, because Ardipithecus rhamnus had opposable big toe. Okay, it was not like what we think of Australopithecus anamensis, which we think had human-like foot with like uh, adducted uh, big toe. So those are the kinds of things that we would like to see. What kind of postcranial elements, uh, what, what kind of postcranial morphology Australopithecus anamensis had? Uh, and as a matter of fact, we're going to go back to the site, to this uh, cranium site, and we're going to start looking, you know, excavating the sandstone to see if the whole skeleton was there. 
So we haven't given up on that site yet. So if we find postcranial elements, it would really be great to actually understand the relationship between Ardipithecus ramidus and Australopithecus anamensis. I think that's a, a major question in our uh, studies. Jonas, Dr. Jonas. I congratulate you, Dr. Harmes and the members. Uh, you are, uh, this is a very modest team, announcing a very important uh, discovery, as Dr. Brani has uh, underlined. But I would like to uh, remember and go back a few years back when we were students. You discovered and announced one of the most important species known to humans. Obviously, it's not yet. Uh, Arbitrus Kadapa. And, uh, that was where you were working for your uh, PhD thesis. And after that, after you started working for Enzo Mille, you announced another species, also this Grimera. Now, this is the third most spectacular uh, announcement, although this is not a new species, but an eye popper, very important finding. I have a question. Uh, what, are you, what is your uh, future plan? What, is, what do we expect in the future? From your work in the uh, world of Italy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Jonas. Uh, and secondly, let me say that these two articles were published in collaboration with 14 other people who are not here today. So there are five authors on one of the papers and 13 authors on the second paper. So this is an international multidisciplinary team that has been conducting research in this, at this site at Warren Zumile for the last 15 years. So on, on, on our behalf, we were, I would like to also thank those guys who've done the work together with us. Now, coming back to your question, Waranzo Mille is um, a very important site. Uh, we're, we've been concentrating on sediments that are dated to between 3.6 and 3.8 million years ago because we, had, we, we started with a specific research question. Our interest was to test the hypothesis of ancestor descender relationship between Australopithecus anamensis and Australopithecus afarensis. And we really needed fossils from about 3.6 to 3.9 because there were no fossils from that time period. So for almost the last 15 years, we've been concentrating on that, on that time period. But we do have four or five different time periods that, that are within the study area. So in terms of what are we gonna do next? I think we have some answers for our initial question. Now we have other questions that we would like to address. Now, the sediments in the Waranzo Mille area go all the way as young as like 3 million years, 2.9 million years. We have sediments. And we have some hominids from about 3 million years. Now, those would be really interesting, particularly in relation to the origin of our genus Homo. What do they belong to? Where did the genus Homo come from? There are so many hypotheses out there right now. And fossils from the time between 2.5 and 3.2, 3.3 would be very critical. So we would go to those sites, to those younger sites, and try to find more hominins from these this places and address the very origin of our genus Homo. And if Stephanie has more to add to that, do you have any research questions that you would like to address in the future? <coughs> yeah. Um We've been working at Ranzumile for over a decade now, and we've made some amazing discoveries. This cranium um, is an incredibly complete specimen. Usually we don't get things this complete in the fossil record. And making a claim to show that Anamensis overlaps with Afarensis in the Afar region required a specimen this complete because actually the differences between Anamensis and Afarensis aren't as large as the differences among some other species, for example. And so the fact that we were able to make this conclusion that these two species really are in the same time at the same place 
I think at least personally, um, you know, makes me think again about the other many hominid fossils that we've collected between the time period of about 3.8 and 3.6, and maybe have, um, you know, a new view, a new eye to go back and look at the other hominid fossils and wonder, do we see other evidence for the overlap of these species? And if so, how far does Anamensis extend into the Afarensis time range? Um, that's one thing that I'd be interested in working on in the future. Okay. Any other question? Dr. Ambrose. Uh, yes, um, I was wondering uh, about other fossils that may have been found uh, during the course of your uh, research. Um, you brought up the question um, of an environmental change in 4.2 million years. Can you say anything from the evidence you've recovered about the environment that um, this species lived in at your site? At Waranzamile? Yes. Okay. Uh, so um, this locality is so tiny that the number of faunal elements that we collected from the locality is about 35. But they do represent about seven or eight different mammalian taxa, including some uh, aquatic um, elements. Now, from the geological point of view, what we understand is that there was definitely a lake, and there was a river fitting into the lake, and there were trees on the banks of the river, and away from the rivers, there was like some open habitat kind of environment. And this is based on our analysis of various um, um, phytholists and um, soil carbon and, and so forth that um, our colleagues who are also co-authors did. So we can't really say that this was the environment in which MRD lived because as we all know, we found it where it died, right? So whether it was living somewhere else and came there and died is a different story. But the one thing that we can say is that because the specimen is not abraded, it was not transported. So it must have been living very nearby. And the other thing that we learned from the, the, the other lines of evidence is this was probably a much higher ground at that time because we have uh, high altitude elements in, in the uh, uh, flora that was uh, analyzed by our colleagues. So we, we can't really say that it was this, but based on the geological evidence and other lines of evidence, all we can say is there was a big lake, and by the, as a matter of fact, this is the, the oldest lake that is gonna be documented from the area, because so far they had lakes from about 3.5, but this is like 3.8, so another lake system, probably in a different you know, rift system in, in terms of the uh, faulting, it was probably bound by you know, another rift, so we add another lake to the evidence. But there is still more work to do. We're gonna extend the uh, survey and exploration further to the west, where there are like similar sediments, and hopefully we'll have better understanding of what the environment was like from additional faunal evidence as we keep recovering it. Any more questions? I guess it's about time that we, uh, we call it off, and uh, I would like to invite somebody to call it up. Uh, thank you, you all, for attending the press release. Uh, by this, we end up our press release. Uh, thank you.